Hello, Jennifer. How are you? And Martini. Welcome to our third podcast. Yes. I thought we'd do something a little bit different today. Okay. Because we can, and you and I know each other so well. It's like, I don't have to think about what I'm going to say. I can just think it, and it goes into Jennifer's head. Mm -hmm. So, that being said, I wanted to give a demonstration on some level of what it is we're doing. So people out there can realize a number of things, including that you don't necessarily have to have a medium <laughs> in order to access the flip side. Absolutely. It's, it's important and it's hugely useful um, so that when I talk to you and you have that access, it's fantastic and we can skip down. So we can do this within whatever it's gonna be, an hour, let's say, right? right. But it's also to demonstrate that what we're doing here is something unique. Right. Because I'm asking you to access the flip side. I'm asking people on the flip side to give you images and senses and sounds and thoughts. And then together we unpack what those things might be. Right? So, and in case people are not familiar with Jennifer, which they may not be, and I know they're not familiar with me, um, Jennifer is a medium intuitive who has worked with law enforcement on missing person cases nationwide for quite some time. When I first met her, she told me about a few of them and I realized as she was talking, oh my God, she's a cell phone to the flip side. I can ask her to access information in real time. And as just to paraphrase for you, as you've explained, mm -hmm. what you get image wise is whatever it is you get. And it's not something that's easy to parse or easy to figure out. For example, sometimes you might be asking somebody who has passed away if they're alive or dead, to paraphrase. Right. And they say, no, I'm alive. How could I talk to you unless I was? But their physical presence is no longer on the planet. You see? So right. that might become problematic because people normally tune in to a medium or a psychic because they're hoping to resolve something in the future. Correct. So, Correct. And so I'm just paraphrasing all this because you and I have been working together for five years, I'm aware of this. But right. in our work, what I've seen us do sort of time and time again is ask people on the other side for verifiable forensic evidence of something we don't know about. Right. And it might not be, it might not be solving a mystery because yeah. it might not be in our life's plan to solve that mystery. Right. But right. sometimes it's to understand the nature of consciousness. True. So. Well, I think, so are you going to go into what we discussed last night? Yes. And okay. I was just giving a preamble to that because Today we're going to cover somebody who is missing, who right. may have been found by now. We don't know. I'm not going to say his last name. Jennifer knows who I'm talking about because I just don't want to make it a, that to be the focus of what we're doing. The right. number second thing I want us to sort of show and demonstrate to people is that people who have dementia are have a higher consciousness that is aware of what's happening while they have dementia still on the planet. So that's another thing of that we can discuss and be aware of. And the third thing, so we're talking about mediumship, how it works, dementia, how consciousness works, how people that are here seemingly out of it, their higher selves is aware of what's happening. And the third thing is, is that it all fits into this flip side research we've been doing, backstage pass and architecture of the afterlife, where it appears to be that we can ask questions of people on the other side who are, their higher self is always there, but they can answer those questions. So that being said, uh, a friend of mine went missing um, yesterday, or the news came out yesterday, and he had been missing for a couple of days. 
And because I'd known him over the years, I'd known him since about 1996, I asked Jennifer casually through a text, you know, maybe this is a topic we can talk about tomorrow, but you want to help me try to find my friend Peter. Right. And she immediately got on the phone and said, well, here's what I'm sensing. This is what I'm feeling. And this is what I'm. And so I recorded that last night. Um, just our chit chatting about this. And just to recap what we discussed, you had mentioned how he and I had met. And you said, he's showing me a, a film, like a movie. Yeah. And I instantly thought, no, that can't be. That's not accurate because, <laughs> um, I mean, I there was a film that was shot years later in Long Island where he lives, mm -hmm. and I was there and he was there, and I thought, oh, is he showing her that? But after we hung up last night, I realized as always, you know, you realize it later on. The very first day that we met was during the Cannes Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And our mutual friend, another Peter, uh -huh. had arranged for a camera crew to come and film this friend of mine, Peter, doing a photo session. Okay, it and was that a model. just looked so crazy because I saw that. You I saw said, that. You saw totally that. described it. Like you said there was a convertible and that he was there and that's how we met. <laughs> and they were filming. And what's funny about it is, the guys who were filming didn't know what they were doing. It wasn't for a movie. It never aired. But that's what we were doing. We were on the Quasette, surrounded by hundreds of people. And the very first time I met him was when this other friend of ours, Peter, had arranged for this photo shoot to happen. It was filming Peter photo, as yeah. a photographer doing what he does. I'm still friends with that model who has grown up and had kids and all that other stuff. So Cindy last Cox? night, I, sorry? Is it Cindy? No, she's too young. No, her name is Sasha. Very good. It's close. Her name is Sasha. Now, I'm not going to give myself even that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, well, but I understand what you're saying. I just felt, yeah, I'm like, wait, no. Yeah. I don't, I don't think he was that connected to her or whatever. It was just a shoot in the middle of a crazy Cannes Film Festival on the Quasette circa 1996. And... And then I was going through some photographs of him and how long I've known him. And I, you know, dug up a whole bunch of stuff. But I thought today we're going to just recap a little bit. Uh, and so people understand. So I asked Jennifer about my friend who had wandered, according to the news reports, had wandered away from his home a couple of days ago. Right. And what's the update, if anything? I, I have not. I as you know, I don't even look. I, no, you know, no. I mean, I mean, I don't mean here. I mean over there. So let's ask Luana. Luana, let's ask our friend Luana first. This is our class. Structurally, let's do what we do. It's a little different from what you do. Just got mad at me for timing. <laughs> <laughs> but Luana, let's ask for permission first. Do we have permission to talk to my friend Peter? Yes, through us, yes. Okay, very good. And would you please assist him in helping us to put these building blocks together? It's more of a class we're doing today, like an exercise in how to access the other side. Mm -hmm. Rather than we're trying to prove or disprove any of these details that we're gonna talk about. But so Peter, so the talk to, go ahead. So when you were describing that it's a class, and so she said, well, what was the first, she's giving me tips on what to say for the class, mm -hmm. um, which you discussed last, like, what, so what was my first hit? And there was a couple things that happened. I felt, I felt like a, a barn. I felt hay and not a barn, but as something dealing with horses. Cause I saw horses and I saw, I felt the hay. Cause what I try to do is, and this might be a little bit too much, but for people that are listening, What's your first image that pops into your head? That's a good starting point. And don't, as you have ta taught me, don't judge it, right? All right. So my first image was that, and then it was also, I felt concrete, like the softness of, like, I know it sounds funny, the softness of concrete, like something that felt cold, mm -hmm. but good. Smooth. Smooth, very smooth. Yeah. 
And so I don't know how that has anything to do with the horses, right? Right. But, and then I saw the number two and I saw an aerial map with like two things, you know, that felt east. And so if I was to walk, which we described, I, the next thing I do is I go into a place that's there. So I go into, I, his, he wandered off from the place that he was at. So I went to the place that he was at, which was his home, correct? Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, the ocean is behind his home. And you validated that. And then, so that gives me a starting point. So for me, I'm like, okay, where am I being drawn to or where am I being felt to go? And that's another tip. Like, where are you being drawn to? And I've not mastered this, believe me, the more I know, the less I know. But what I do not do is have fear with it. Thank goodness. Even on cases like this, when it's a time, es time of, you know, essence, mm -hmm. find this person. So... First thing is, what is your first hit? Luan is putting me back on track. What is your first hit? If you, let, let's just say that you want to know where your kids are <laughs> at a time where they're not confined to the home or even if in the home, just go where, without asking or looking, just go, where are they? What's your first image that comes mm -hmm. to your mind? You can start off there, something simple, and then work your way, like then say, where am I being drawn to? Because that's a feeling. So. The seeing part of it is what they call clairvoyance. Mm -hmm. The feeling part is claircognizant. Mm -hmm. And you did say that you had a feeling that he went down a dirt path right. initially, and he went to what seemed like a second building or two buildings away uh, structurally. But you also pointed out that it was a memory that he was working yeah, off of. It could have almost, been that was there. Yeah, that was there, let's say, in the 1960s or 70s. So somebody right. with dementia is remembering, you know, that little thing pops into his mind and says, oh, if I go down this way, I'm going to run into whatever. And he made that trip. And at some point when he got to the building that you felt or saw, that it was transformed. It wasn't the way he had remembered it. But yeah. when he got inside, he either tripped, fell, he teetered over, perhaps, because he mentioned his head hurt. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Um, this particular case is very, very complex because we're dealing with somebody that has dementia. So what they're feeling or seeing is different than what might be there. Right. That's right. why they don't know where they're at. <laughs> right. And that's what's great about our yeah. discussing or unpacking it. Because right. you said right. you were seeing black and white images, and that usually, when you say that, is like the past. It's a and so, memory or something that was there. Yeah, and he was showing you these black and white images of horses. So that might mean, let's say, because we can ask him. Or maybe he took pictures of horses there. That's true. So while we can, and let's just take this now slight turn. Peter, would you mind sitting down and telling I, us? I think it's very ahead. important that we tell the audience about how we're talking to his high, like, for instance, when I do crime work, I never say that they're gone. Okay, right. no one's ever gone. But some people, because we're saying we're talking to Peter, might think, oh, is he dead? So I think you should go over the fact that we're talking. Okay. And and how we're talking and so it's what Jennifer is referring to is in the flip side research over the past uh, 10 years that I've been filming people under deep hypnosis. They say consistently that we bring about a third somewhere between 20 and 40% of our conscious energy to a lifetime. Everybody does that. And right. while you're here on the planet, two thirds of your conscious energy roughly are back home, for lack of a better term, because people are asked, what's heaven like? And they say, well, I'm, I'm, what I'm getting is that it's home. That I, when I, after my lifetime, I went home. So I just refer to it as home. So back home, two thirds of our higher consciousness let's, for lack of a better term, our soul is always back home. So even when a person is alive and, and their brother dies, they might be greeted by their living brother on the other side because that two thirds is always back home. And that's how we can ask Peter to sit down and talk to us whether he's alive or not alive. So another thing that I find interesting, like prayer or, 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 uh, meditation okay mm -hmm. 
meditation is listening to the answers of prayer. That's, I don't know, somebody said that, it was not mine. Um, when you get quiet, you can send good energy to people that are alive. That's, I, that's how I believe prayer was formed, is to send that energy of, please, you know, healing light. And wh however that looks to you or however your practice is, there is no wrong way to do it, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so that also comes into play that we're talking to us, their higher self. Like I just real fast asked my daughter's higher self, I'm like, how are you up there? And she's like, bored. That was the first thing. <laughs> was bored which I thought that was funny because it's not something I'm thinking of right and right. she probably is bored she's done all her homework she's gone for a run she's, done, she's one of those kids that is quarantined on. yeah so um just think of it that way like prayer when you send things to people or when you send living but also that's a good reminder of what how powerful your thoughts are so if you're thinking about all these negative things you're sending that out too so just a little just a little tidbit there. Just a little sidebar. Okay. All right. I'm going to set that sidebar aside. I know, I'm but I, go back. I felt it was important. Because it, it's, it is important to say. Of course it is. But I'm going to ask Luana a question. Motorcycle riding by Mount Kailash Six here. Six feet. <laughs> I'm going to ask Luana a question. Okay. Do you want me to show Jennifer the photographs that I, was going, that I brought to show to her? Or do you want to interview Peter directly? Which you prefer? She says, thank you. Show one of the 10 or one of the whatever. One happened. of the 10. Okay, here we go. This is one of the 10. I'm going to show you share. I'm sharing this. Um, All right, so his house. Well, Peter. Would you show her where your house is? Okay. So you see the ocean down at the bottom and that's, I wanted you to see that. So that's where the ocean is in relation to his right, house. So his house is, okay. Low? Up here. So it's, it's the house that's, so I can't sh show you where I'm pointing. Yeah. If you're, it's- Well, the, look at the quadrants. See, there's, there's one, two, three, four at the bottom four in the middle and four at the top. So the top, it's the- um, That's correct. It's the one the that- top, The yes. top, yes. Yes, right? that is correct. Okay, that's his house. Can you put um, your cursor on it? Yeah, yeah, I will, I will. Here, we'll just go back one and this, this is the front of his house, okay? That's okay. the door that he walked out that you saw him walking out of last yeah. night. Okay. Um, and let's go a little bit closer. I know Luana said, don't make a big deal out of it, but the very top of the screen, that's his home, okay? okay. And the reason I chose to show this, to you, this wide one to you, if you look down in the bottom quadrant, quadrant you kind of see, um, you can't see my carrot moving up and down, but- You can. Oh, well, you can, okay. So coming out of the house, here's the dirt path, and then there are these structures here, which look like sheds. There's one here, there's one here, right. and there's one here, because this is all a dirt path. If you get close up, this, all, this is like a driveway. It kind of runs along like that. So that's the one that kind of jumped out at me, like could have been a horse barn, could have been horses there in the past. You see? Got it, yeah. But I don't know. I've actually been here. I've had dinner at his house. I've sat out in this portico and this patio with him. I've walked with him over here, which is like this weird house that burned down. Oh, no, what am I saying? Thank you, Peter. That was his old house. He's had a fire. Okay. So this is where, that's the house that I saw. When you asked me where's his house, that's the house I picked. Oh, that's wow. how it was shown to me. Okay. Oh, so I was fully confused by you going, I'm like, that's not it. I'm okay, very good. That's... I'm sorry, and thank you, Peter, for correcting me. You know, if you work with somebody like Jennifer long enough, you get, it rubs off on you. Yeah, that's his old house. So that's not good. Well, that burned down. That burned down, like, right. back in the 19... But if I'm, if, if he's showing me, a, like, a place where he is, used to live, that yeah. he feels like it, he's living there now, he went to go look for, then we're looking at that whole beach area. 
Well, it could, you know, we'll put it this way. You're, you're having a, a dementia moment, let's say, and it's like, oh, I think I'm going to go walk for on the beach. Right. You know, and of course, in his mind, he's always walking back to where he used to live, right? That's, where, that's the, where I was shown because the beach was right there. The cliff was right there last night. So I'm like, the water's right there. It's behind the house. Okay, I'm going to stop that chair and come back to you. Okay, that's unusual. As, you know, you always blow my mind. And, you know, it wasn't until this moment when I looked at that and I thought, I've seen that before. Now I realize why. That was his house. And there was a terrible fire back in the okay, so 90s, 2Ks. That's the, house, that's the house that I was working from last night. Okay, so either way, two houses away or two structures away is still that barn yeah. or that shed. Isn't that interesting? Because it was back. Because that's what he didn't It's understand. interesting. It is interesting because you what? saw it from right. his perspective right. and so not from that house and it was like a, it was too okay. that is <laughs> fascinating. It still is right. It's still the same. <laughs> Very good. Listen, I don't mean to laugh. Um, but this is the kind of work Jennifer and I do. And often in the middle of a session, she says something that I ding, you know, the bell goes off in my head, and I realize, oh. She's referring to how it looked to him back in 1965. And, and that's why I was given black and white. This okay, is thank I've, you. I've done probably, I mean, I've given thousands and thousands of readings. I can actually say that. Um, and cases I've probably done, I mean, probably close to a thousand. I mean, I don't know. I don't know, but a lot. And the only yeah. reason this is because they still learn every single case is different every single person is different i've never i've had probably 10 cases of where we had to find dementia people that had dementia yeah it was but it was quick it wasn't they weren't gone for two days they were gone you know what i mean yeah um so people are going to be asking us is peter still on the planet and i'm not going to ask you to tell me that but I'm going to ask Peter to tell me that. You see, I know that people are curious. Why aren't you guys looking for him if they're still he's still missing? So, well, Pete. So Peter, okay. Peter just showed me he's been on and off the planet for the last you know three years. <laughs> that's the part that's that I can laugh about. All right. Well. So for me to find him, like the you know, is he dead? And I know is I, his body I, no longer functioning? Let's just call it dead because nobody dies; they just go home. But is some portion of your life energy still in that physical body? No. Okay. It, you I, know, and, and again, for the audience, Jennifer's not saying that he passed away. Mm -hmm. I, he has answered a question that was very specific about his impression of what happened or what's going on. Okay. If yeah. they find him okay, that would only mean. At this moment, when he answered, either That's he was teasing right. us. This or... is right. Go ahead. So I'm not giving myself. I'm not giving myself an out. When somebody, and I'll share this with you, on the cases that are pretty traumatic, like really, yeah. really traumatic, where somebody was killed through violence in some way, form or fashion, that energy is so crazy to me. I know instantly if they're here or not, mm. um, because they're still you know, adjusting on the other side. And, and it's usually right after something happens, but, um, and they always tell me when they're going to be found. They always say to me when they're going to be found. That's another interesting aspect when they're, when they passed away. Now with Peter there, you know, I didn't feel that craziness that create, you know, that, oh my gosh, I got hurt or whatever. I didn't feel anything. I felt someone that just fell and just was like, oh, you know, like just, and then you said something that he used to sleep on concrete. Hmm. Or yeah. No, I, when no, there was a time one summer where I was at, uh, my other friend Peter had arranged to rent Andy Warhol's home, which is down the block from uh, Peter's. And there was some shooting going on. He was doing some modeling shoot and another convertible was there. Rennie Harlan was there shooting some footage. And I spent a couple of weeks uh, in this, in, you know, this estate, 
what was I doing there? I don't know. But I would wake up in the morning and walk down to get some coffee and there would be a body lying on the cement. And I was like, well, what happened to that guy? Oh, well, it's Peter. And I would step over him, you know, because this is a guy who, who spent a lot of time in Africa, a lot of time in tents, a lot of time sleeping on the ground. He told me it just, he was more comfortable sleeping on the flat earth, either it was inside or outside. So, and we also discussed something last night, which I helped you to figure out, but it was the Peter back in 19, I think it was 96, had a, an accident in Africa where he was run over by an elephant. He was like literally stomped to death. And our friend Peter had arranged for him to come back uh, and, and get the kind of care in New York from a mutual friend, Dr. Uh, can't think of his name right now, old pal. And um, so from the time that I met Peter in Cannes from that point forward, because I met him before the accident, and then for the next, I don't know, years I would see him in Manhattan. I had dinner with him and David Blaine once. Here, name dropping. And, um, but it, you know, just in terms of, of knowing him, he was such a character and he had so many interesting opinions. And he hung out with all walks of life. If, if you were at his table and there were 20 people there, there, half of them might be mobsters or, I don't know, drug addicts or whatever. Just people that you would never find yourself in the same space with. But they all, he was like a light. And people were attracted to him, like a moth to the light. And uh, all I can say is I always had wonderful times with him. He had no judgment. He had no judgment. He had no judgment. So no. let's ask him. So let's shift this into an interview with Peter, like okay. we do. Yes. Um, and aside from the fact of that we are under the impression he's no longer on the planet, let's just speak to his higher self, because we can, and we've done this before. So I'm going to ask you, Peter, the simple, normal questions I ask everybody on the flip side. Luana, you can help prep him for this. So Peter... Who was there to greet you when you crossed over? Can we pause this for a second? Yeah, we can. Absolutely. Hold on. Three, two. And we're back. So Jennifer asked me if I thought it was okay to talk about what she wanted to talk about. And I think in terms of our lesson, in terms of our class here, it's important. So what she just recounted to me, and I'll have her repeat it, was that now that she realizes he was showing her a memory from the previous, from a while ago, that the events may have happened in a different manner. And so tell me what, what, that, what that inspired you or what came to you since then. And we can ask him, Peter, what are you showing her? So he showed me, okay, I'm going to go back to what I was seeing last night because I couldn't understand it because the ocean was very important. Yeah. And he was showing me that his house was right there and the ocean was behind it. He said that over and over again. Okay, I so I, I thought he was talking about the new house, but he was talking about the old house. No, it was an old one. Even though they all look the same, especially in yeah. Montauk, right? Yeah. Um, so he was showing me that's where he felt he was, was in his home, which was by the beach, which was also burnt down, right? Right. So he was showing me that, and he was showing me wanting to go visit the, like, like the horses or something with hay, but I like going, and that's where the whole two, the two things over. Uh -huh. you know? And I do believe he did that and maybe went like, he did that first, got confused. Um, and if you think about his new house, yeah, two things over, right? Mm -hmm. That way. From the ocean, yeah. Yeah, from his from his old house. Okay. Is it two? Is it two things over from his old house? Roughly, you know, it's probably a uh, hundred yards, maybe two hundred yards. Okay, just give me a second while I talk to him. But yeah, I'm saying let's ask him. So, Peter, did you fall in a structure or did you fall outside?
He says he fell in a structure. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's a structure. I think. Well, let me. But uh, he said <laughs> that I'm like, was that a st my next question? Because I've become you. Was that a, was that a construct in your mind at the time, where you just felt you thought you just fell in this structure, uh, or was it outside? Because I'm being shown what was there and what was not there. What was that's a good question. So was he outside or inside? He was outside. So I was going to ask the question I was going to ask was, are you showing Jennifer other times that you've fallen outside or this one particular time where you fell outside? No. Um, he says, well, then he showed me being trampled on. He's fallen many times everywhere, he says. So they showed you being trampled by what? The elephants. By an elephant, yeah. The elephant. Um, and he also was chased by like, I don't know, some type of tiger. It felt like he got too Leavable. close. Yeah. Um, and so let's clarify. Peter, are you saying that you, you thought you were going into a barn? You thought that's where you were going mentally, but you tripped and fell over like the cliff near your house that you... Your body, where is your body? If we're looking at it from a bird's eye view. Um. You made me feel immersed in water. Okay. And like, remember, he showed me my head, my head hurt last night. Yeah, he did mention that. And then it went away after we talked, which was funny. But when I looked at, when he was, when I was getting the information from him, you know, I just, you know, I made it simple. This is how I work too, you know, like if that, if, <laughs> If this was the cliff, are you yeah. there? Are you over here? Are you over here? Yeah. And he's making me feel like he's right here. Okay. So near near the ocean, near the uh, water line. Then he showed me a shoe, and I don't think he had shoes on, but he showed me like a shoe or some, which also just means a piece of clothing. Yeah. Which they'll find on the beach. So they might find a piece of clothing on the beach. I see. And, and then we talked about him. You saw him wearing gray sweats, I think. That's yeah, it. I did. And then I looked at it and that's what I called him like, oh my God, he was wearing race fire. Yeah, you looked it up and it turned out that was accurate. Yeah. Very good. So, all right. <laughs> you know, what's unusual is that I asked Peter if he wanted me to write to his wife. And I did send her a note last night talking about finding him in a structure. So Peter, which yeah. is kind of funny he's going to be when she when they don't find you on the structure they're going to consider me a nutball i am one it's fine it's okay no but, right now right now i don't know if he's like in his mind it's a it, it was a structure like he that's where he was going he, listen he passed away going over a cliff this is why i want to skip past the physicalness of this event Right. And I want to go to the higher self and ask him some questions about his journey. So, Lou, sit him down. Who was the first person? Now, you mentioned his seeing his mother last night and that he was very much in love. with. Was that the first person you saw or was that just somebody eventually you saw? Who was the first entity or being that came to, to greet you? His mom. His mom. Very good. And how did she look to you? Did she, you look young or old? She had her hair, like she showed, he's showing me like somebody like in the sixties. So the way that she appeared to him was somebody that had like her hair up, you know, those like a bouffant kind of a thing. Kind of hair. 
and the earrings. I can feel the earrings and like the makeup that's really, you know. Heavy. And then, yeah. But then I believe she was really, nat like from what I'm getting, she was really natural later. Like her hair was great. Right. The, the first hair. initial image was so to jog his memory. And then once right. she made that connection, she just. So she showed how she was. Natural how gray. She was. Just beautiful. She was beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, you get beautiful I family. He I was, don't know, I have no idea what she looks like, but that's just what I got later. Yeah, well, the whole fam damly was pretty strikingly beautiful. But, okay, so since you crossed over, who else have you seen besides your mom? Oh, the whole class. <laughs> the whole class. Yeah. And did you say our class? Is that what you said? Yeah. 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 And for those who are not familiar with our class, that's Backstage Pass. Luana, who was an actress who was in over 30 movies and 300 television shows, really oh. knew every actor alive. You show me Jimi Hendrix. Okay, like, so, and, oh the, and people that she knew or met in her lifetime have shown up in our class, including Jimi Hendrix, including a number of other people. But go ahead. What was that like, seeing Jimi? He said it was really interesting seeing John Lennon and Jimi. Like he said, that was, he goes, then I'm like, oh, this is the best. Like at first, it's kind of like that car ride for the other people. Yeah, like Harry Dean Stanton's car ride. ride. Yeah. So uh, describe that, if you could, Peter. So you're, you've seen your mom and now come coming out of a mist or what is it? I, how did you see them? Were they dressed as you knew them or dressed how? Well, how did you see them? They were going to play a concert, and he was supposed to do photography for this concert that they were going to be in. So they were like, come on, dude, we got a gig. Hold on a second. So Woodstock? No, well, don't touch it. I'm it's allowed. Gonna... Um... He didn't go to Woodstock. That's the interesting part. So yeah. I feel like he was supposed to be invited to Woodstock. They were recreating Woodstock, but he realized he's like, I never went there. So it's not a memory. I see. So that's part of the realization. You're, you're no longer on the planet because you're at a thing that you never went to. You think you're in brilliant. a dream. Like it was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And we've seen this a lot in our, in our constructs, which is people seeing themselves in a, a venue or an event where like they're, oh my God, this is so cool. And then they realize I was never there. Or, and then their friends are looking at them like, well, you are now. Something like that. Hold on. And if, if he was there, it wasn't what he was supposed to be doing. So it wasn't a memory, something changed. Yeah, something so different. It might have been a current event where he was supposed to photograph him, but then he was just a spectator, or vice versa. So, Peter, I want to go into your life a little bit. Let's okay. just roll it back. And I know it's all a huge chessboard to you now, but let's go back to a time when you were in prison in Africa. Can you go back to that? Like yesterday. And what was that like? What happened? He just describes everything being so, I almost want to use an accent, but he's, he's describing everything being so beautiful, so decadent when it came to the animals, when it came to- Being in Africa. Yeah, being in Africa. It was at a time where it was still scary, but he said through relationships and through what he was doing, they opened up a lot to him. Okay. He's it's making, interesting because he's not answering my question. He's making Africa look good. Okay, but I want to know about a specific incident that happened to you, my friend, where he's, you were in prison in he, Africa. Well, he actually did show me that, so I took it I understand. As, he showed you beautiful I, Africa first. I didn't hear you say prison. He showed me prison. Oh. At, Oh, so you were there before it got worse. That was my mind. You can read. I see, you know. I see, I see. Right, so so tell us about the prison incident. What happened? He said it was, he was, 
making it to where someone couldn't kill the animals or doing something. That is outside. correct. That and is correct. I didn't do that, and so that's why they arrested him and put him that, in prison. That is correct. That is correct. Not going to let them shoot. Not going to let Very them good. Shoot. Well, I think you might have been involved with the death of someone, a poacher, somebody who was trying to that's harm it. the animal. That's it. Okay. And somebody rescued you in prison. Was it? Don't think of a celebrity or a name. Think of a male or female. Somebody rescued you in prison. Well, he kept showing me Michael. So a Michael, Michael Jackson. I don't know. Oh, why. Michael. But, Michael you Bay. know, sometimes you, they'll pop the image of a person in your head. But I'm specifically thinking of somebody who came to you in prison and helped get you out of there. The person wasn't here, felt like, but hold on a second. They aren't part of our class. No, they're still on the planet. This person, I'll, you know, I'll give you a hint. I thought of Robert. I thought of Robert. I thought of someone like Robert. Like Robert. Okay, very good. Uh, somebody might have been involved like Robert, but this is a woman. Yeah. And she... Oh, you mentioned her last night, I think. Um, I did mention her last night, but I didn't mention any of this. Elizabeth Taylor? Was <laughs> <it>? <laughs> yes, he was friends with Elizabeth, but no, uh, his wife. His <laughs> wife rescued him from this prison, and his dear and lovely wife, who is mourning his passing or his missing or whatever she's mourning today. So that's that was an unusual arrangement. She came to that prison and helped him get out of there because she had some cachet. Yeah. An unusual story. Great love story. It's very but I was trying to get him to show it to you. But Well, so if you think of Elizabeth Taylor, you think of love. If you think of, you know, so he was trying, I would have not thought that. I'm sorry. It's all right. We don't have to knock everything out of the park. Plus... We're talking to a guy who's got a lot of people looking for him. I do. <laughs> and he's got a, well, he's got to focus on all the people that are looking for him. All right. And there's also the possibility that he doesn't want to talk about that because it'll hurt, hurt you know, uh, the feelings will be released, you know. Well, she's going to be, she feels bad because of that one. And it was somebody else that left the door open. It wasn't her. It's there. No one's at fault. Look, you get to 82, you're lucky. This is a guy who got trampled by elephants. This is a guy who... <laughs> he just showed me a cockroach like he's never going to die. I, he show, you know, this is a guy who never met a drug. He didn't, you know, get past. Right. Um, so that being said, well, you know, no, he's a charming guy. Former, I think Gen X, which I'm a part of, the generation that had to entertain themselves the whole time. I'm yeah. laughing about that because... They said, and if you were, you know, ex drug, ex drug user, you'd love this even more because you were used to like being gone for like days on end by yourself yeah. in your room. Well, let's put it this way: the way Keith Richards, who is recovered and healthy and everything else, had a reputation for somebody who skirted death all the time. <laughs> well, Peter Beard well, was I somebody. I a, a meme where on the Rolling Rolling Stones, right, with Keith Richards. Yeah. How he was the only one not wearing a mask. How they all were wearing a mask, <laughs> covering their face. And how he's just like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to die. He's not going to die. How did he um, see me until just now? <laughs> hilarious. So what do you miss about being on the planet? You've only been off it for a short amount of time, but I'm sure he's you have wife. access to that. Right. What? He's his, wife. his wife. His wife. Najma. His wife. And he has a lovely daughter named Zara. He would get glimpses of being able to recognize her and see her and that's what kept him there right? I, yeah i know she's re she rescued him many many times many it's times so, he's like maybe now she's gonna be able to sleep at night for the first time you and know? not worry about him i understand yeah we've but all daughter, had dementia relatives well, loves, so does his daughter have a couple of children like three children i don't know i don't um, know his daughter but i know of her I just got three, so I don't know if it's three, like she has one child, there's three in the family, I'm not sure. Okay, Peter, you brought it up, Liz Taylor. Have you talked to her since you've been back there? 
Oh, yeah. That's why he, he showed me Michael Jackson, Liz Taylor. Oh, very good. Of course. Makes sense. We've spoken to both of them. Uh, Michael's got a huge chapter in our new book, Backstage Pass, where he talks about a lot of things in context. Uh, Liz Taylor, I think we talked to briefly, but let's ask Lou. Should we ask Liz to step up and tell us what was it like to see your friend Peter? Why? <laughs> Okay, this is so funny. I've never seen this. She goes, it wasn't as exciting as I thought it'd be because he thought he was still on Earth up here. <laughs> I because, see. Because he's going back and forth. He didn't know yeah. where, like, it's funny, you know. I like mean, it wasn't she, a big deal. Well, it wasn't yeah, startling. Yeah. yeah. He was already there. And to give context to that, we've heard this quite often in the research, which is somebody who has dementia, a big percentage of their... Conscious energy is already over there navigating. I right. talked to a friend of mine's father, remember? And he said, I asked him, like, what can you do over there? Because he was still on the planet. He was in a okay. hospital. And, you know, he said about 10% of him was still here. And he said, you can do anything except take off because <laughs> you, you're right. still attached. Correct. Um, you know, you can't. Let me ask you another question. Hold on. Sure. I just thought, because I still don't trust information that comes down, I'm the biggest skeptic of this work. So no matter how many times he's told me, which has been like 10 times I'm no longer here, I still don't believe it. And your mind always overrules everything else. So I'm like, so are you still attached to your body? It was another way to ask. And he's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, listen, it's a little, I'm sure it's disconcerting to hear me chuckle whenever you say something, but I am kind of, wired because yeah. we've been doing this for so long and we've talked to so many people and it's important to repeat this concept so actually somebody wrote to me the other day on facebook and said i've heard you talk about this and i i wish you would just mention it that no one dies alone no Even when your loved one or your parent or your grandparent because so she, of this quarantine this is, the, this is yeah because, okay sorry i was just going to say we aren't aware of it, but there's a huge team of people that help us to come here. Guides right. and teachers and loved ones and former lovers and former family, all of them conspire to help us get here. And they're all waiting for us when we depart. Well, who wanted, we're, never, we're never alone. Right, well, who wanted to show me when you said lovers, like there's a whole big room then up there for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, for Peter, her, <laughs> Peter. Look. Oh my goodness. Okay, so, but when you said that too, because there is a lot of concern, and I just heard it was just so sad. Like, um, there was a family that, you know, their mom got sick and they couldn't visit her in the hospital and she passed away. She died by herself, basically, right? Yeah. That's but my point. Didn't. So, that, I know that was your point when I interrupted, and I'm sorry. No, but, no, please go no. ahead. I'm just patting myself on the back. Yeah. So, Everyone needs to know that no, and that was such a great point. No one dies alone, even though, like, I can't believe I wasn't there. I can't believe this. I watched a funeral, a Jewish funeral yesterday, and it was so great to watch. You know, it was on Facebook Live, and it, very, I love these people, Ron Bloom and Marcia Bloom, very dear to my heart. And he, um, his mother passed away, and the things that, that was said about her, you know, and it just brought back, like, even though nobody could be there physically, the words that were said were so amazing. Like, okay, for all the hugs you can't give, call someone. For yeah. all, you know, pick up the phone. Yeah. Just you know, make, make your relationships more meaningful because, yeah, you don't get it. You might not get to see them. Right. You know? And it, it, I don't know, it just brought, I was very happy. Well, I also quoted your dad because your dad gave us the, probably the most uh, profound teaching when it comes to grief. Uh, and I reminded people that I had, you and I were speaking to your dad and you were having a hard time because you were still in the throes of grief. It only passed away within that year. Just yeah. 
name. But I, so I said, let's ask him. Let's ask your dad. How do we help people with grief? And he said, tell people that grief, he said, tell people to try to move grief to nostalgia. And I asked, like, what does that mean? And I remember you said, I don't know. And I said, well, let's ask him. And he said, when you can move, grief is only sad memories and nostalgia is both a mix of both sad and happy memories. And when you can move grief over to nostalgia, you begin the healing process, which is a deeply profound thing to say. But even under the auspices of, this is a gentleman who's no longer on the planet <laughs> explaining to us. So it's not only to realize nobody dies, everybody goes home. They go off stage, everybody. It's important to know that, but secondly, for you, mourning, you can't take away someone's grief. Somebody accused me of being a grief thief, which I think would be like a cool <laughs> logo on a cap, grief thief. But <laughs> they were upset, like you're stealing people's grief. But no, we're not, no one can ever, you can never get over, don't ever try to get over someone. Ever just learn to cook like in time, like he said. Well, also realize they're still connected. If and, you know Jennifer, you can talk to them. Yeah, and if you you could talk to them anyway. You can talk that, to them anyway. That is what we've been doing for the last five years. That's what, it's true. Out an easier way for people to know, you know, that they can't talk to. And I something occurred to me too when you were mentioning that earlier when we first started this. It's not comfortable. It's like, it's like when you're in the throes of this, it's not comfortable thinking that you could talk to your loved ones. I understand that. It's like if you've never played tennis before, picking up a racket and going out there saying, okay, I want to learn how to play, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's me. And, and it's uncomfortable at first, but if you, it's a muscle though. The more that you practice it, you know, no one's gonna, no one's gonna get hurt playing tennis. No one's gonna die playing tennis. No one's gonna be like, you just keep learning. And the more that you learn, the more that you'll get and the more that you'll feel it. And you just have to, you do have to trust it. It's not blind faith. It is, it is actually trusting the universe. Well, we did come up with a pretty wonderful, uh, and it's in the end of Backstage Pass, the first two anyway, it was a workbook. And it was so people could do this on their own without. Got it. You yeah. Know. And so, real fast, the yeah. third one, the third book. Have you? I know we're almost out of time. Have you um, done the audio for the third one already? Yes. If I keel over tomorrow, there is an audible in the You're works. Not it going takes anywhere. Oh, well, that's, well, we know that. I don't go anywhere. I just go over there <laughs> on the other side of that mountain. No, but, I lost yeah, someone to you haunting me. Are you kidding me? It's, uh, it, yeah, it's in the works. Um, but I was just going to say, we've given people a, a workbook. And just to give it to them really simply, and it came from Michael Newton, who, Morton, as we call him, who showed up one day in a session. And I asked him, because I was going to go on Coast to Coast Radio, and I said, Give us a one, two, three. And he said, like, how do you communicate with your loved ones? And he said, say their name. I right. said, do you have to say it in your head or do you have to say it out loud? And he said, it doesn't matter, Richard. And the second was, he said, ask questions. Number one, say their name. Number two, ask questions. And I said, well, how do people differentiate between what they want to hear and might be actually hearing from somebody? And he said, when you hear the answer before you can ask the question, right. you know you've made a connection. Right. So what I tell people to do is like this, simply take out a photograph of your loved one, picture them sitting across from you, imagine it, pretend it's allowed, it's a game. You're Either pretending. I was looking on my phone to see if it's come up yet. What's that? Um, oh, it'll, it'll it's up. It's up. Tesla power and light. Not audible, but yeah, don't focus on, on that. Off. Hello. All right, let me just finish. People are like on the edge of their seats here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, hold, sorry. On. hold on, hold on. <laughs> so, picture that person sitting across from you. Grab their hands in your mind's eye. Pretend you can grab their hands. Think about like what do the hands feel like? Are they warm? Are they cold? Just focus on them. And once you've done that. 
ask them simple questions. And if you don't hear anything, ask them to nod, shake their head, or do that. No one goes like this. Well, you can no go one, like that, but just... No one talks with their mouths open. They always... That's right. Talks. You just hear it. Yeah. But that being said, if you can't get anything, you go, how are you? And you get nothing. And they just... Because it's hard for them to realize that you're actually asking a question after all these years of waiting to talk to you. And suddenly you're asking them a question and they look at you like, are you really listening? Okay. So, but you ask them to nod, shake their head, shrug. Ask simple questions. Is this really you? That's an easy one. How are you? How am I? Etc. And then move to like more complex questions, the kinds that we ask people that you couldn't know the answer to. Who was there to greet you when you crossed over? What do you miss about being on the planet? Who are you hanging out with? What are you doing over there? <laughs> what are the lottery numbers? When you hear an answer before, you can ask the question. Then you know you've made a connection. You'll start to ask a question. You go, so whatever happened, and then you get it. Grandma did it. And you're like, oh, my God, that's what I was going to ask. How did they know? Because they're outside of time. Right. It's easier for them to anticipate to know what your engrams are cooking up. They know what you're going to ask. So that's how you verify to yourself. So, Peter. Thank you for coming to our group and our session. What else do you want to tell us? He loves this. Hold on. He says, thank you for looking for me. I've now, I now understand how important this work is. Because, and he just showed me going through you and then going out to the masses about how, like, you don't think about it until you can't talk to somebody, right? You don't think about what that could be like. Um, what would you like to say to your wife or daughter? That's important. Well, you first showed me love, like just this most amazing love. And then he showed me Cipriani's, but that's a different conversation. Hold on. For those who aren't aware, Peter's artwork is throughout the Cipriani chain. Beautiful photographs of Africa. Great place to contemplate Peter's life. Tell them not to waste any time looking for me. I don't know how, th that's not even something you could say. <laughs> well, you just said it, buddy. No, right. I I've asked him like 10 times, I'm like, are you, what? You know, I'm like, okay. no, I'm not gonna say that, but hold on, but give me, give me, hold on. Could we add, cause you're here. don't know where, like he said something about, I do know how loved I am. Um, and for them not to ever question that. They both took care of him like nobody else could have. Thank you. And I have my memory from the other side. So I have my memory back. So he's, he showed me like being able to function. Like he's yeah. not any, you know, it's not like he's not any, he wasn't in any pain. He never, he didn't feel anything with whatever happened to him. But he's yeah. sharing, he's just like, now I can talk to him like I did before when I wasn't. Yeah. Oh. Yes. So and so, I, and just to clarify, when he says, don't waste your time looking for me, you could say because he's here. Because I got that afterwards, yes. So, so that you can connect to him, because he hasn't gone anywhere. He hasn't right. disappeared. He's just not on our plane. 
but you can access him, talk to him, get jokes out of him. <sighs> yes. Okay, what else? You have a big sign. With, he's going to come by with signs. He's going to come by with... To his um, family. To his family. And there's so many different... He'd love to take him into all the memories, all the pictures that he had. You know? oh, let me ask you this, Peter. It's a good question. I've had this experience, and I want to ask you about it, that photographs are actual quantum fields because they capture time. Correct. That's and so that if your friends or loved ones are in a photograph and you look at it and meditate on it, you can access that slice oh, of time. Absolutely. And go into it. Absolutely. So that's a way to talk to you, to yes. see photographs of you. He's like, I had the best in. job. I had photographs. <laughs> I was. Yeah, photographs of everybody. Yeah. Of everything. Yeah. Any He's opinion like, about yeah. animals on the other side? Even ones he didn't want. Oh, that he was right. So whatever the opinions about animals that he had here, he was right. It's interesting. He was a contrarian when it came to the way that they took care of elephants in Africa. You'd think that he was, but his thing was to stop putting them in cages, ca you know, and saving them here. They need to roam free. Savo was a place that he photographed and became famous for it. Elephants. And he's like, and then they and then I got trampled. <laughs> and then I got trampled. Well. So and that's his fault. He said that that was because somebody else did something that made that. Yeah, he was he was filming a guy who had done something. It wasn't his fault. He got trampled because of another guy. So are you aware of I any? Not, by the way, I did not know that. Yeah, you you, you wouldn't know that. that. Nobody knows that. Were yeah. you are you aware of animals over there now? It's beautiful. It's so no, there's nothing. Describe it. Tell us, please. It's like Africa over there with the animals without borders or without anything holding them in. So what animals have you seen? Oh, all the ones he protected. All That's the ones he took photographs of. Yeah. Is there any that you recognize? He's showing me, well, it's interesting because he definitely had a pact with the elephant that hurt him. Um, Describe that. And he, never, that? he never had any ill feelings towards that elephant. Um, but what do you mean by a pact? I understand, but explain that, Peter. Do you mean that you and the elephant had an agreement prior to that incident? That that's what would occur? Yes. They had, they had an agreement. Right. Important to clarify that. And for people to understand that events happen often because before we even came to the planet, we worked out in advance things that would happen, including with animals. Right. And Peter, let me ask you this. Are all animals sentient? Um, hold on one second. Yeah. Okay, hold on. He just showed me, it was very fascinating. How were the animals? <laughs> so when you asked that, he said no. He showed Meaning me humans. Every, all the animals are sentient except humans. Yes. It's an interesting point, which is all the animals are aware of the flip side and aware of consciousness, but humans are not. No, they're just, a di they're wild animals. We're wild animals. Very they're good. All, they're all connected because of Mother Earth. They have to rely on the Earth giving them food and shelter and everything else that they need. And he just showed me all the connections to it and how that's how they're sentient. Um, they just know what their purpose is here. Whereas we're just like, dumb man. <laughs> trying to figure it out. Trying to figure it out. Well, that would be a wonder, that would be a perfect Peter point of view. Um, sorry, it's about my class. You gotta go.
I gotta go. I'm sorry. Okay. No, let's thank Peter for showing up. We appreciate it. Luana, we appreciate this class. And we appreciate you guys helping us to pass this information along to people on the planet. There's a reason we call this podcast Hacking the Afterlife. And it's to show people that anyone can access their loved ones, their teachers, their guides, their friends, and even their higher selves to understand why they chose this path. Yes. <laughs> Yay! Okay, we'll see you next week, guys. Thank Bye. you, Jennifer. Bye. We love you. Love you. See you later. Bye. Bye.